Hi, I'm Amna Khalid, the John Stuart Mill Faculty Fellow, and I'll be your guide, or your host, as they say, to this and future episodes of Heterodox Out Loud. First, let me tell you why we're doing this podcast. As an organization, Heterodox Academy prizes pluralism and disagreement, and we've featured a wide range of topics and viewpoints on our blog. So to kick off Heterodox Out Loud, I decided we should reflect on the mission and purpose of universities. Many believe that higher education is in crisis right now. In this time of pandemic and hyperpolarization of American society, it comes as no surprise that institutions of higher learning are beginning to rethink and question what their purpose ought to be. So for the first few episodes, I've picked articles that dig deep into the complexities of this issue. Today, you're going to hear from Jonathan Haidt, one of the co-founders of Heterodox Academy. He'll be narrating his piece, Why Universities Must Choose One Talos, Truth or Social Justice. This blog is actually a summary of John's argument from an hour-long talk that he gave at Duke University in the fall of 2016. His analysis remains relevant, and the need to think deeply and critically about the purpose of a university has only become more urgent in our times. John's piece has sparked a lot of discussion, and in subsequent episodes, we'll feature responses to what he has to say here. And now, Jonathan Haidt. Why Universities Must Choose One Telos, Truth or Social Justice Aristotle often evaluated a thing with respect to its telos, its purpose, end, or goal. The telos of a knife is to cut. The telos of a physician is health or healing. What is the telos of a university? The most obvious answer is truth. The word appears on so many university crests. But increasingly, many of America's top universities are embracing social justice as their telos, or as a second and equal telos. But can any institution or profession have two teloses or teloi? What happens if they conflict? As a social psychologist who studies morality, I have watched these two teloses come into conflict increasingly often during my 30 years in the academy. The conflicts seemed manageable in the 1990s, but the intensity of conflict has grown since then, at the same time as the political diversity of the professoriate was plummeting, and at the same time as American cross-partisan hostility was rising. I believe the conflict reached its boiling point in the fall of 2015, when student protesters at 80 universities demanded that their universities make much greater and more explicit commitments to social justice often including mandatory courses and training for everyone in social justice perspectives and content. Now that many university presidents have agreed to implement many of the demands, I believe that the conflict between truth and social justice is likely to become unmanageable. Universities will have to choose and be explicit in their choice so that potential students and faculty recruits can make an informed choice. Universities that try to honor both will face increasing incoherence and internal conflict. Please note, I'm not saying that an individual student cannot pursue both goals. I urge students to embrace truth as the only way that they can pursue activism that will effectively enhance social justice. But an institution such as a university must have one and only one highest and inviolable good. I'm also not denying that many students encounter indignities, insults, and systemic obstacles because of their race, gender, or sexual identity. They do, and I favor some sort of norm setting or preparation for diversity for incoming students and faculty. But as I have argued elsewhere, many of the most common demands that protesters have made are likely to backfire and make experiences of marginalization more frequent and painful, not less. Why? Because they are not based on evidence of effectiveness. The demands are not constrained by an absolute commitment to truth. As I watched events unfold on campus over the past year, I began formulating an account of what has been happening, 
told from the perspective of moral and social psychology. I was invited to give several talks on campus, and I took those invitations as opportunities to tell the story to current college students at Wellesley, at SUNY New Paltz, and at Duke. By the time of the Duke talk, I think I got the story worked out well enough to send it out into the world in the hope that it will be shown on many college campuses. It's long, but it's as short as I can make it. There were eight pieces to the puzzle, and I had to present each one in order. I begin with two quotations. Quotation number one is from Karl Marx, 1845, Theses on Feuerbach. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Quotation number two, from John Stuart Mill, 1859, On Liberty. He who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good, and no one may have been able to refute them. But if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. Marx is the patron saint of what I'll call Social Justice U, which is oriented around changing the world in part by overthrowing power structures and privilege. It sees political diversity as an obstacle to action. Mill is the patron saint of what I'll call Truth U, which sees truth as a process in which flawed individuals challenge each other's biased and incomplete reasoning. In the process, all become smarter. Truth U dies when it becomes intellectually uniform or politically orthodox. So here's the first piece of the puzzle. Telos. Each profession or field has a telos. Fields interact constructively when members of one field use their skills to help members of another field achieve their telos. For example, Amazon, Google, and Apple are businesses that I love because they help me achieve my telos of finding truth as a scholar. But fields can also interact destructively when they inject their telos into other fields. For example, business infects medicine when doctors become business people who view patients as opportunities for profit. I will argue that social justice sometimes injects its telos of achieving racial equality and other kinds into other professions. And when it does, those professions betray their telos. Piece number two, motivated reasoning. A consistent finding about human reasoning is that if we want to believe Proposition X, we ask ourselves, can I believe it? But when we don't want to believe a proposition, we ask, must I believe it? This holds for scholars too, with these results. Scholarship undertaken to support a political agenda almost always succeeds. A scholar rarely believes she was biased. Motivated scholarship often propagates pleasing falsehoods that cannot be removed from circulation even after they are debunked. And finally, damage is contained if we can count on institutionalized disconfirmation, the certainty that other scholars who do not share our motives will do us the favor of trying to disconfirm our claims. But we can't count on institutionalized disconfirmation anymore because there are hardly any more conservatives or libertarians in the humanities and social sciences, with the exception of economics, which has merely a three-to-one left-right ratio. This is why Heterodox Academy was founded, to call for the kind of diversity that would most improve the quality of scholarship, at least if you embrace Mill rather than Marx. Piece number three, sacredness. Humanity evolved for tribal conflict. Along the way, we evolved a neat trick, our ability to forge a team by circling around sacred objects and principles. In the academy, we traditionally circled around truth, at least in the 20th century, and not perfectly. But in the 21st century, we increasingly circle around a few victim groups. We want to protect them and help them and wipe out prejudice against them. We want to change the world with our scholarship. This is an admirable goal, but this new secular form of worship of victims has intersected with other sociological trends to give rise to a culture of victimhood on many campuses, particularly those that are the most egalitarian 
and politically uniform. Victimhood culture breeds moral dependency in the very students it's trying to help. Students learn to appeal to third parties, like administrators, to resolve their conflicts, rather than learning to handle conflicts on their own. Piece number four, anti-fragility. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Friedrich Nietzsche was right, and Nassim Taleb's book Anti-Fragile explains why. Kids need thousands of hours of unsupervised play and thousands of conflicts and challenges that they resolve without adult help in order to become independently functioning adults. But because of changes in American child rearing that began in the 1980s, and especially because of the helicopter parenting that took off in the 1990s for middle class and wealthy kids, they no longer get those experiences. Instead, they are enmeshed in a safety culture that begins when they are young and that is now carried all the way through college. Books and words and visiting speakers are seen as dangerous and even as forms of violence. Trigger warnings and safe spaces are necessary to protect fragile young people from danger and violence. But such a culture is incompatible with political diversity, since many conservative ideas and speakers are labeled as threatening and banned from campus and the curriculum. Students who question the dominant political ethos are worn down by hostile reactions in the classroom. This is one of the core reasons why universities must choose one telos. Any institution that embraces safety culture cannot have the kind of viewpoint diversity that Mill advocated as essential to the search for truth. Piece number five, blasphemy. At Truth U, there is no such thing as blasphemy. Bad ideas get refuted, not punished. But at Social Justice U, there are many blasphemy laws. There are ideas, theories, facts, and authors that one cannot use. This makes it difficult to do good social science about politically valenced topics. Social science is hard enough as it is, with big complicated problems resulting from many interacting causal forces. But at Social Justice U, many of the most powerful explanatory tools are simply banned. Piece number six, correlation. All social scientists know that correlation does not imply causation. But what if there is a correlation between a demographic category, such as race or gender, and a real-world outcome, like employment in tech companies or on the faculty of STEM departments? At Social Justice U, they teach you to infer causality, systemic racism or sexism. I show an example in which this teaching leads to demonstrably erroneous conclusions. At Truth U, in contrast, they teach you that disparate outcomes do not imply disparate treatment. Disparate outcomes are an invitation to look closely for disparate treatment, which is sometimes the cause of the disparity, and sometimes not. Piece number seven, justice. There seem to be two major kinds of justice that activists are seeking. Finding and eradicating disparate treatment, which is always a good thing to do and which never conflicts with truth, and finding and eradicating disparate outcomes without regard for disparate inputs or third variables. It is this latter part which causes all of the problems, all of the conflicts with truth. In the real world, there are many disparities of inputs, but anyone who mentions such disparities on campus is guilty of blasphemy and must be punished. I work through an example of how the attempt to eliminate outcome disparities can force people to disregard both truth and justice. This is no way to run a university. Piece number eight, schism. Given the arguments made in sections one through seven, I think it is clear that no university can have truth and social justice as dual teloses. Each university must pick one. I show that Brown University has staked out the leadership position for Social Justice U, and the University of Chicago has staked out the leadership position for Truth U. I close by urging students on every campus in America to raise the question among themselves, which way do we want our university to go? I offer a specific tool to raise the question called the Heterodox University Initiative, 
If students on every campus would propose the three specific resolutions to their student government, perhaps as the basis of a campus-wide referendum, then students could make their choice known to the faculty and administration. The students would send a clear signal as to whether they want more or less viewpoint diversity on campus. At very least, a campus-wide discussion of Marx versus Mill would be a constructive conversation to have. Jonathan Haidt. I hope you enjoyed his piece. In our next episode, you'll hear Oliver Traldi's response to John, where he contends that truth by itself is not sufficient as the purpose of the university. Before I go, I want to remind you to sign up for our upcoming webinar on February 11. I'll be talking to John McWhorter, Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. The event is free and open to the public, so please help us spread the word. I'm Amna Khalid. Please subscribe to our podcast and thanks for being a Heterodox Out Loud listener.